This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Crimes and Consequences. I'm Tanya, and this is my lovely co-host, Talia. Hello. So today I have a pretty good story to tell you guys, but before I get into it, I would just like to remind everyone to hit the subscribe, follow, like button, whatever you have access to. And thank you to True Crime Daily for hosting us. Thank you. And, and you have a pretty good story, I or you have, have a great okay, story? Okay, I have a great story, yes. Okay, she has a great yeah. story. You know, I didn't want to say exciting, because people get upset, or, you know. So Yeah, that's a, yeah. yeah. why is true crime exciting? True yeah, crime shouldn't I know. be exciting. Right? It shouldn't be, I guess. But, I don't know. It's serious. We're being serious. But for a true crime story, this is excellent. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. And it is a story that was suggested to us by one of our listeners, her name is Duane Sat- Sanchez. Is du- she a patron? Nope, she's not a patron. She's a listener, and she sent us an email. I'm okay. not sure exactly when, but she suggested this case. Okay. And I know nothing about it. Well, good. So. Then you're going to be on the edge of your seat just like everyone else. All right. right. Let's do it. Okay. In the early morning hours of September the 19th of 2008, a passing motorist stopped to investigate what they had found on the side of Northwest Tulip Street in Andover, Minnesota. The concerned passerby found a crashed 2004 KTM Enduro Rendezvous motorcycle. Okay, so it's a crashed motorcycle on the side of the road. And with what appeared to be the lifeless body of a young woman Mm. lying roughly about 50 feet from where the motorcycle crash was. It was fall in Minnesota, and Andover was just a few short miles from what's called the Halloween capital of the world. Oh, really? That's, I thought that was in Romeo, Michigan. I know. That's why I was surprised, but it's Anoka, Miss, uh, Minnesota. Okay. The Halloween capital. So I guess it's probably big at Halloween. I would I would, <laughs> I guess. I would, I would hope right? so. If it's okay. Capital. Anyway. Residents in the area, you know, the the Halloween, they have just this passion for all things spooky. So it's probably a good place to visit. Um, And I'm mentioning it because the motorcycle, it didn't appear to be like decorations or like a Halloween setup. You know, like it, with a skeleton, like yeah, a body like, with a right. motorcycle. Like, you know, sometimes put people like in okay. my neighborhood this past Halloween, people had like a garbage bag, look like a body was like duct taped in a garbage okay. bag. Okay. This wasn't. What appeared to be a Halloween decoration. It just okay. appeared to be a true gruesome accident. Mm. And it was discovered just past midnight. Um, and the Anoka County Sheriff's Department was called and they arrived on the scene. Investigators responded to the motorcycle accident. They began processing it. It was apparent to some that there it's obviously a motorcycle accident in which the driver of the motorcycle lost her life. Mm -hmm. Upon further investigation, investigators were asking themselves, like, well, how could this have happened? Not a lot of females that are out there alone on the roads and motorcycles. At midnight or a little before midnight. Right. And some things just didn't seem to add up in their eyes. The young woman wasn't wearing any shoes. Well, that is weird. And no shoes were found near the crash site. She also had no cuts, scrapes, or other markings on the soles of her feet. Yet it's an accident on a motorcycle. Yeah, you know, you would expect to see something um, because there is also, like, sharp foot pegs on the motorcycle. So I guess for your shoe, to, I've never been on one, but apparently so your shoe can grip, you know, this, the where you were putting your feet. Well, if you've ever known anybody that's had a motorcycle accident, they're pretty messed up. Yes. You're going to have road rash. Well, she some did missing have... Her, some are missing legs. Well, she did have some injuries, but they okay. weren't to the soles of her feet. She was found with several wounds to the back of her hands, as well as wounds to her forehead. 
But again, the injuries didn't seem consistent with where her body was found in relation to the motorcycle. Red tie-down straps were also found wrapped around her body and arms. What's that mean? Uh, they were these straps. Like, like for what? I, well, I'm going to tell you. Okay, tell me. <laughs> All right, I'll wait. I'll tell you eventually. I'll wait. No identification, no cell phone was found or anything that could identify, you know, there's nothing in her pockets, nothing that could identify this young woman. And they didn't find anything even like scattered around. So here investigators are tasked with piecing together this massive puzzle. Like what happened to this woman? Who is she? Um, and how did she get there? I'm going to tell you about a woman named Natasha Wallen. She was also known as Tasha to her friends and family. She was born in 1979 in Minneapolis. Tasha grew up with her parents and siblings in Anoka, Minnesota, until her parents divorced and during her school age years. Tasha was known to be very kind, extremely smart, and she was a free spirit. After graduating from Anoka High School, she moved on to complete her bachelor's and master's degrees. She loved the outdoors. So she's smart. Yeah, she's, she's educated. Very smart. She's educated. She loved the outdoors. She would often go on walks, visit parks. She enjoyed riding her motorcycle. She once traveled out west for a week by herself to explore. Wow. Parts of the country. I know. Wow. She worked full time at a company named Achieve Services, Inc., which was a training agency for disabled adults. Oh. She also worked as an acupuncturist. Nice. 20 hours a week at the family friendly friendly Chiro chiropractic, I can't talk, chiropractic clinic in nearby Andover. Friends and co-workers stated that Tasha had an absolute heart of gold, and she had a special quality that would let others know that she was seemed to be, like, truly interested in she getting to know you. She sounds like a free, just a free spirit. Yeah, just like a lovely person. And she was always kind of the champion for the little guy or, like, the underdog, um, even when she was in school. While in high school, at Anoka High School, Tasha met someone she thought was her Prince Charming. His name was Ryan Boland. He was about five years older than Tasha, but he was as smitten with her as she was with him. Isn't that illegal? Uh, yeah, maybe. Never mind, that's that. a side note. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan was really charming, and, you know, when he wanted to be. Although some of Tasha's friends saw Ryan kind of as a bully and a little bit annoying, Tasha didn't let that get to her, right? She really kind of didn't even notice it. Because she liked him. Yeah. He, he showed her his softer side, and, you know, that's what she fell in love with. So she soon began to ignore, like, anything negative her friends said about him. And they had many things in common, they um, both loved to ride motorcycles. Okay. Okay. As Tasha and Ryan began dating, the relationship quickly became serious. So what is it, like a 17, 23-year-old yeah. yes. kind of thing? Yeah. It wasn't like she was, you know, 14, 14 and he was 19. Yeah. Okay. And not that it's, you know, anyway. Ryan came from a loving family. His parents, Patrick and Sonia, both worked in education his father, Patrick, left the education field to begin his own construction company called Bolin Construction. The company was just a success from the start. So they were um, wealthy. They lived in a big house in Anoka, and they were able to spend their winters in their vacation home in Arizona. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Ryan always had nice cars He, you know, that were purchased by his parents, and he seemed to always have money. After he graduated from Anoka High School. His he, parents' money. Yes, his parents' money. After he attended, or after he graduated from high school, he attended college for a short time, but he ultimately decided to quit college and go work for his father's construction company. I mean, that just makes sense, right? A couple of years into the relationship, Ryan, the shine on Ryan seemed to dull a dull little bit. Dull a little yeah, bit. You know, he started to lose that a little happens. bit of his, of his charm it to happens. Tasha. In October of 1999, and she's about 20. Okay. She'd been out with some of her friends, having a good time. Time got away from her, and she got home, and she, at this point, she's living with Ryan. Oh, they're living together in yeah. Arizona? No, 
They're in they're uh, Minnesota. Minnesota yeah. still. Um, okay. She got home later than he was expecting her to oh, get home. Oh, shit. So he was pissed. He's okay. Pissed. So where were you? He was pissed that she was out later than he thought she should have been. And he headbutted her. What? When she got home. And this happened in front of her friends when they dropped her off. Oh. Yeah. Oh, hell no. Yeah. Tasha's friends were shocked at this act of violence. Yeah, and that's they, horrible. Yeah. And they urged her to report it to police. She did go. To the police department to file a complaint, but she ended up not pressing charges against Ryan for this abuse. The police deemed the situation one in which, you know, abuse had clearly happened, so they arrested him anyway. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. He was quickly released from jail. He returned home. In 2003, so this is like four years later, Tasha learned that she was pregnant with her. She's still with him? She's still with him. She's still with him. Yes, she's still with him. Okay. She learned she's pregnant with her and Ryan's first child, and it was going to be a daughter. Um, They've been together a long time mm -hmm. now. Yeah, exactly. They've been together. It's probably been... Seven, eight Yeah, seven, eight years. And I'm not going to um, say the name of the child, like, for real, but we're going to call her Samantha. So little Samantha was born in the summer of 2004, and both families just adored this new addition. I mean, she's the first grandchild, right, for both families. And Ryan and um, Tasha were super excited. They moved into a new home that same year. And this now was Tasha's first home that was, like, actually in her name. So she was really excited about that, and she was excited to raise her daughter there. As they were spending their first Christmas in their new home, Tasha confided in her mother about more abuse that had been taking place. Knew it. Behind closed doors, yes. You don't just headbutt somebody once. No. She told her mom that Ryan would frequently hit her, choke Mm. her, and would do all of this in front of little Samantha. At her mother's insistence, Tasha called the police after telling her that Ryan had just hit her. Ryan left the house before police arrived, and he was never a- held accountable really? for that action then. Really? Yeah. And many friends just then begged Tasha to get help. Get out. Yeah, get help, get out. Um, get out. But she always refused. I just got this new baby. Yeah. And she was just really afraid of what Ryan would do if would she get out. Yeah, Because exactly. most of the murders occur in dom- with domestic violence when domestic violence, I used to study and work at a domestic violence shelter pregnancy is a trigger for violent men and they they tend to increase the violence and once a baby is born huge trigger for them yeah so So i can only imagine what she was the control Mm -hmm. they start like if they wanted control before now that there is a baby they have to have control that makes a lot of sense Tasha and Ryan's relationship then be, soon to become, it quickly became like an on again, off again relationship. Tasha loved Ryan and she wanted their family to be together, but she would sometimes distance herself when the abuse became increasingly worse. Like she's trying, right? She's trying and then he's bad yeah, and then I'm there's sure. a honeymoon phase yeah, where absolutely. I'm sure he's sweet as Hi, and sweet as a peach. Saying it would never happen again, mm-hmm. and, you know, I'm so sorry, and, um, you know, I'm sure this whatever happened. you need me mm-hmm. to do. But during the times that Tasha left, Ryan acted as though he was single. Oh. He would casually date multiple women oh. while trying to woo Tasha back. Oh. But and he's married. Yeah, and but Tasha didn't do the same. She couldn't easily just move on, right? right. Um, after they reconciled. Ryan was still sometimes seeing some of um, the women he had been she seeing before. Her. Of course. And it seemed like Tasha knew this and was just ignoring it. And she really just tried to make the relationship work for her. Kind of hard, though. Yeah, for her daughter. I mean, she she tried. Kind of hard when he's got a girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. Uh, girlfriend on the right? side. I mean, yeah, it's extremely okay. difficult. Eventually, Tasha just became sick of Ryan's abuse. And she started to take action now to really separate herself and her daughter from him. Tasha confided in a coworker on September 16th, 2008, 
that she was miserable with Ryan and she planned to get orders of protection against him. PPO or restraining order. A restraining order. Whatever you have in that state. Yeah, whatever's in Minnesota. Um, In Michigan, it's a PPO, personal protection order. This coworker had been in similarly abusive, an asimilarly abusive relationship and was able to give Tasha some advice on how to ensure that she would retain custody of Samantha by Minnesota laws. The friend also helped Tasha with debt consolidation paperwork since Ryan had started to spend more and more of their money to support um, his increasing, guess what, drug habit. Drug, I was going to say drug or gambling mm-hmm. or yeah. prostitutes. I yeah, don't, right. I don't know. The big three of usually where money goes. Tasha then demanded that he move out of their house by the end of September that year. The girlfriend of Tasha's brother was planning on moving in with Tasha and Samantha, like to help out for with expenses, the monthly expenses. Because oh, well, wait, we get a, now we got a man moving in. Mm-hmm. I'm not it saying was, anything bad about Natasha. But no, I'm it was thinking, Tasha's brother's girlfriend. So it's a woman. I know. Oh, woman. OK, gotcha. yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I probably said that awkwardly. Right. Yeah. You were fine. <laughs> on the morning of Friday, September 19th, 2008. Ryan received a call from Tasha's supervisor at Achieve, letting him know that Tasha had not made, made it. it to work. Yep. I don't know. Ryan told the supervisor that he and Tasha had gotten into an argument the night before, and she had left the house on her motorcycle. Mm. He was certain, you know, that she would, of course, show up for work. And Ryan has Samantha at this point, so he gets her dressed for school, and after dropping Samantha off for school that day, he went to Tasha's dad's house. Her father and brother had already been notified that she was missing, and they were visibly upset. Ryan reiterated to them that they, she, he had this argument with Tasha, and she left on her Took motorcycle. Took off on her motorcycle, yeah. and I don't know anything more. Exactly. She never came back. She never came back. I haven't seen her. So the family then notifies the police in Anoka County that Tasha could be missing. And now it's become apparent who that woman, that unidentified woman. On the motorcycle. Was, yeah, that who was found on the side of the road with her motorcycle in Andover. And so now Tasha has been found and identified. The morning of September 19th, an investigator showed up to Tasha and Ryan's house to question Ryan. He wasn't home, so the investigator looked around the outside of the home. While looking inside an attached garage, the investigator noticed a red. Can you do that without well, a there's probably warrant? a window. So okay. if it's in, okay. isn't that covered under plain a, sight? Yes. Yeah. So we need a search warrant. No. Otherwise. No, okay. he's looking through windows. Okay. And that's one of the exceptions to a search warrant. Yeah, you can it's plain sight. Mm-hmm. So while he's looking, you know, peeking into this garage. He sees some red tie-down straps hanging from the wall. And it's the exact style that had been found wrapped around Tasha's body. And what I'm picturing these tie-down straps are, like sometimes you have like, what is it, a winch? A wench? Winch. Where you like, you tighten it with something and it's probably like a canvas strap. Mm -hmm. And you make, like when you're wrapping something or tying down like, um, I don't know, a cover or something you know, you're transporting things. That's what I'm picturing. Okay. It's like you have well, the strap, you're, now you're too. tightening it. And I'm not thinking it's like, it's not like a, like a zip tie. I'm no, I know what you're talking yeah. about. And, it's, and you can like pull it tighter. Like, yes. once you yeah. get it. Not that I've it, ever used one, but either. I've seen it being I'm, used. I, yeah, <laughs> That's I'm, what I'm picturing. I'm though. trying to describe yes. something I don't use. Exactly. Right. I've seen it. I mean, so at some point in my life, I've seen something like right. that, right? My okay. dad, somebody. Okay. So I'm telling you now, this, uh, this seems like the exact strap that was okay. around her body. So this finding prompted the investigator to get a search warrant for the house as well as for Ryan's truck. After thoroughly searching the home, authorities discovered evidence of blood in the garage as well as a carpet with a piece of purposefully cut out oh okay all right that's yeah. not fucking suspicious I know. like if you're gonna Jim do pieces that, of carpet cut out and blood in your home right now no you need to just you need to just rip up every piece of carpet and, and make it look like it. you're putting and in new carpet or something right yeah get I mean, rid of it get rid of it I i'm mean, sorry I'm not, I'm not giving advice yeah i'm not giving advice on how to get no, away with no. a crime but 
I mean, if you're going to do something like this, it's pretty this, obvious. Right. Something happened on that carpet. Um, Brian's truck was eventually located at his parents' home, and the investigators discovered traces of blood on the tailgate, mm. steering wheel, and both the driver and passenger seats. A broken orange plastic clamp was also found in the bed of the truck. Like a clamp? Yeah, like- and it matched pieces of an orange clamp that were found near Tasha's body and the wrecked motorcycle. When you say clamped, what do you mean? Like um, something that I could hook on the yeah. table and then tighten? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The preliminary autopsy findings um, were given to investigators, and it stated that the medical examiner had determined that the injuries sustained to Tasha's body were not consistent with injuries you would get in a motorcycle accident, and that she had died as a result of blunt force trauma to her head by multiple blows. In Ryan's interview with police, he recounted the events of the night, you know, before she stormed off on her motorcycle, and just which was just hours before her body and the motorcycle were found. So according to Ryan, he and Tasha had been arguing. Ryan claimed that Tasha had been out to a local bar and had been drinking heavily. Okay. All and, right. And Trying this, to make her look bad. Yes. And this caused some friction in their relationship, you know. He said that he attempted to stop her from leaving. You've which, been drinking too much. Don't yeah, leave. Don't, don't leave. Don't leave. And, you know, that's what caused the argument. She comes home super drunk, and he questions her about it, and now and she's, she's going to just storm off. Drunk storm off. On the motorcycle. And so she does, he says. He specified that the argument never became physical, never, because, you know, that's not in the M.O. for this relationship. And he claimed, Except for the headbutting. Yeah, the headbutting that things. was witnessed by her friends and the abuse that she told her mother about. So Ryan claimed that, you know, this was the last time I saw Sasha, or Tasha. She stormed off and I saw her leave on her motorcycle and that was it. However, one of Tasha's friends rebutted this comment by telling investigators that Tasha, she didn't like to go out partying, that she was too focused on being a mom to her four-year-old daughter. And she wasn't going to go out on her motorcycle alone to the bar. No, right? no. And she wasn't going to leave her child. Not with leaving her baby. Yeah, she wasn't going to leave her daughter. Blood analysis at the time of the autopsy would further support her friend's claims as the medical examiner revealed that Tasha's blood alcohol level was nearly non-existent. Really? Mm-hmm. Surprise! Surprise! Neighbors of Tasha and Ryan also stated that they didn't hear the familiar and distinct sound of Tasha's motorcycle being cranked, you know, firing it up in the, right, in, right, the in that right. evening. Well, it had to been at some point because it was out Does there. it, though? I don't... <laughs> Does it? I don't know. Does it? I'm jumping to conclusions. Yes, you are jumping to conclusions. My bad. I mean, I'm sorry. You know, Ryan has a truck. Okay, don't spoil it. I me. know. Detectives also took note that Ryan arrived at the interview wearing a sweatshirt. And this seemed odd to investigators because the weather had been warm and sunny. Um, uh, with temperatures reaching near 80 degrees. He's trying to cover something up, mm-hmm. isn't he? Mm-hmm. So when they asked about the sweatshirt, Ryan said, well... I have some scrapes and scratches I mean, from the argument. You know, I did have a scuffle with Tasha. Okay, now it's a scuffle. Mm-hmm. Even though, you know, at first it was not Non-physical. at all physical. Right. But now we had a little scuffle because I was trying to prevent her from leaving. Mm-hmm. I mean, and she scratched me. And, you know, that's what he's telling them is I was just trying to get her to stay. Just trying to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Bucker. Right. Anoka County Sheriff's Officer, Lieutenant Paul Summer commented about the evidence that was found at Ryan's home. He said, quote, the search warrant made it clear that some sort of a violent assault took place in that attached garage. And the blood evidence is there. It made the per- picture perfectly clear, end quote. So she was beaten in the garage, mm-hmm. uh, the attached garage. That's what the police believe. So the following day when she's after she's found, September the 20th, it's a Saturday, they found the piece of carpet, and it was stained with blood. And where they found it was they were searching nearby dumpsters. Oh, so he did get rid of the bloody carpet. The bloody section, right? 
I mean, how do you explain uh, a missing chunk of carpet? And guess how far it was from Ryan and Tasha's home? It was a half a mile. And that's he didn't where. Try very hard. No, I mean, come on, dude. I'm, and I'm not saying. I'm not mm-hmm. suggesting how to do right. things. Right. I mean, really. That, really. But you but know, I'm just I love. Saying, let's, if you're going to do it, try to be clever. Yeah. <laughs> I love stupid criminals because when stuff like this happens, it's like, oh, that's how people get caught is because they're stupid. So, I mean. Well, first of all, they do wrong things. Well, yes, of course. And then they do them stupidly. And then they try to cover it up stupidly. Yeah. So. And so we like to make fun of those people. Yeah. So Ryan's Not just the a dumbass. I mean. Ryan's a dumbass. And which I'm glad for because now police now have caught. even more evidence he's against him. So this dumpster's a half a mile. From their home, the bloody carpet was found to be consistent, surprise, surprise, with the type of carpet that was found to be cut from the carpet that was in the garage. Investigators now tell Ryan during his interview, well, the injuries to Tasha's body didn't happen because of a motorcycle crash. So he just started acting like he just didn't understand, like it does not compute, right? What, like, what are you trying to tell me? A detective told Ryan that the working theory was that He gets into a physical altercation and something happens in the garage. He hits Tasha over the head and knocks her out, kills her, whatever. This happens on the carpet and she dies. And do they they know what they hit, what she got hit with? Did they have an idea? Um, no. Just some blunt force trauma. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, I'm sorry. You're forgiven. I'm sorry. You're forgiven. I lost my place, you guys. I'm sorry. We forgive her. Okay, here I am. He he denies, you know, that this happened. Of course, because he's going to continue lying to police. It wasn't me. He even says, you know, um, I'll take a polygraph to prove my innocence. Police are like, okay, cool. We'll we'll set it up. And that's when they Ryan started to shut down and asked for a lawyer. He didn't show up for the polygraph. No, I knew it. And asking for a lawyer ends the police interview, and Ryan was able to leave the station. Um, And Lieutenant Summer told reporters, it's not unusual for a suspect to lie about what happened, but it's unusual for them to just concoct a whole other scenario that would happen. He should have just kept his mouth shut the whole time. Yeah. I mean, he's trying to, you know, cover up what happened with a big fat lie. That didn't make sense. Right. So a search warrant is now issued for Ryan's parents' home. Oh, why? Because they're figuring there's some evidence there. I'm sorry. There's some evidence, but I wonder, I mean, you have to have something that supports the reason yeah. why you would want um, a search warrant. And you have to be looking for specific items. So they were looking for specific items. Yes, they were. At his parents' house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were. I'm not sure exactly what those items were, but the police searched the house. They found Ryan in a bedroom, um, in an open dresser in that room. They found two bags of marijuana and a spoon used to heat cocaine. Oh, so now wait, wait, a spoon used to heat cocaine. That's not cocaine. That's like crack then, right? Yeah, I think so. You snort cocaine. Yes, you snort cocaine. I don't know. Do you? No. Well, you know, you. I mean, you've seen enough yeah, movies. No. I know. Yes, I you have. You snort cocaine. Yes. It's something different. Um, I think it turns into like crack when you heat it up. I'm I'm not a trained professional. Yeah, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. That but was, yes, he was doing that. So police find all these drugs. And so now he's handcuffed again, brought back to the police station. He's arrested for drug possession. So now, you know, he's still insisting that. The night, uh, yeah, the night Tasha died, nothing physical happened. I just, you know, tried to get her to stop leaving. But he said, you know, and if someone did hurt Tasha, I have no idea who it could be. Um, You know, everyone loved her. So I don't know who would hurt her. Of course, police, you know, are like, like, you're so full full of shit. shit. Mm -hmm. And he had lots of motives to kill her. Um, As he's being arrested, investigators quickly discovered that there was actually someone who didn't like Tasha. Besides him? Yes, besides Ryan. And it was someone that was close to Tasha and Ryan. And Tasha was even afraid of this person. And this guy is Tim Bolin, Ryan's brother, his younger brother, by 18 months. Okay. 
Tim Boland was once a promising baseball player. He was awarded a baseball scholarship to St. Cloud University. He studied, he studied English, and he broke several baseball records for the university. I mean, he played there. He graduated with plans to become an author. But his life quickly began to spiral out of control after getting married. He started using drugs. Doesn't that happen a lot? Yeah. It's unfortunate, right? <laughs> right. And he had recently been separated from his wife. Tim had a growing coke habit, and he'd also been dealing drugs to support his drug use. So Tim and his two dogs had been living out of his Chevy Malibu um, when he wasn't able to, like, crash on a friend's couch. Oh, that sucks. And Ryan offered Tim, you know, he can stay with, you can stay with Tasha and I some nights. And um, because he now he's... Tim is running out of friends' couches that he can crash. Yeah, on, now right? he's, yeah, when when you're at the level where you're in your vehicle, you yeah. know, your family's really got to step in. Yeah, absolutely. But Tasha didn't like Tim to be at her house with her and her oh, daughter. Oh, yeah, he's doing drugs. Exactly. And shit. Tim had previously physically assaulted Tasha. What? Yeah, because well, he felt. Well, then I really wouldn't like him no, there. He felt that Tasha was ruining his brother's life. Oh, okay. Yeah, by going to the police and accusing him of abuse. Tasha felt that Tim was unpredictable and volatile, and she told many friends that she was scared of Tim. So investigators mm. started looking at him a little bit closer, that maybe he was also involved in Tasha's death. One piece of the initially unexplained evidence found at the crash scene, so, you know, when they're doing the crash scene, they're collecting everything. Right. And what they found was a single piece of dog hair. That was Wait, discovered on the motorcycle. A single piece of dog hair? Yeah. They found a single piece of dog hair. Yeah. Found a little on a motorcycle. Hair. One little dog hair. God bless them for working so hard. I love hard. forensics, right? So after testing, they were able to link that dog hair to Tim because it matched hair that belonged to his yellow Labrador retriever. But Tim had been living with them, with yeah. her. Yeah, right? that's true. So it could be tramped. Transference. That's probably what his defense said, right. right? Thank you for thinking like a criminal defense attorney, right? So I'd rather be a prosecuting attorney, but yeah. that's fine. Because <laughs> everybody needs a good advocate. Everybody's allowed, right? That's why we're attorneys. That's the American way. Everybody's allowed a defense. So Ryan Bolin was arrested September 22nd, and he was charged with second degree intentional murder. And aiding and abetting second degree murder. Wait, second degree intentional murder yeah. is isn't That's, that premeditated? Um, how do you have second I don't degree know. I don't intentional? Know how Minnesota's laws work? Uh, the laws right. must be weird there because yeah. if it's intentional, it's usually premeditated. Yeah. And um, he they also charge him with aiding abet and abetting second degree murder in Tasha's death. Well, who did he aid and abet? Well. Tim, Tim Bolin was also arrested. Okay, there you go. With the same charges as his brother. Okay. So they're not that, sure, right? That makes sense. They're covering both, like, one of them might have killed her, mm -hmm. and the other one was aiding and abetting, or, you know, vice gotcha. versa. At least they're covering their butts with these charges. Right. So, yeah. Officers took note that there was dog hair found on Tim's clothing at the time of his arrest as well. Bail had been set for a million dollars for each of them. Damn. And they go to trial because these guys aren't saying that they did it. They had separate trials, but each had similar proceedings. Both brothers pleaded guilty to manslaughter by well, taking they... an Alfred plea. An Alfred plea? Yeah. And the purpose of an Alfred plea, for those of you that don't know, is you're waiving the defendant's right to a jury trial. So they were saying that, you know. There's enough evidence against me that I could be found guilty by a jury. So, therefore, I'm going to take the Alfred plea. Yes. And plea. Doesn't mean I actually did it. Yes. But I believe the prosecutors could show there's enough evidence to convince a jury. Yes. And prosecutors were able to factually piece together what really happened to Tasha mm -hmm. that night of her murder. Um, on Thursday, September 18th, the Bolin brothers went to a bar in nearby Ramsey, and this bar was the Spectator's Bar, and they got there about 8.15 p.m. After a third person joined them at the bar, the three left the bar between 9.30 and 9.45, so about an hour and a half or so. 
The third person is suspected of meeting the brothers to supply one or both of them with drugs. Drugs. Okay. So nothing really to do with the, the murder. murder. Ryan and Tim returned to the home that Ryan shared with Tasha. And so Ryan and Tasha now start arguing. Tasha was also furious with Tim and accused him of setting up her father and brother in a drug sting operation because there's some other shit going on behind the scenes that, what you know, she's pissed about this. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was out in left field. Yeah. But, he okay. and Tasha believed that Tim used his position as a confidential informant. Oh, she's a confidential informant. Yeah. To shed light on her family. And this was done as a way to help Ryan get sole custody mm. of their daughter. So a lot of times in custody battles, people make up evil shit about yeah, their they former do. partner. Yes, they do. They do. They do. They do. And it's just evil. Um, with no evidence whatsoever. No, nope, just accusations. Mm -hmm. Ryan stated in court documents that Tasha tried to call her brother to inform him of what she suspected Tim of doing. But Ryan grabbed her wrists. At this point, Tasha scratched Ryan's wrists and neck as they argued ryan claimed that tim had been sitting in a chair in the garage wrapping black duct tape around a baseball bat as oh, they argued no 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 yeah. that reminds me of the walking dead i know right me too mm -hmm. ryan testified that tasha threatened to call tim's estranged wife and tell her that tim had been having an affair at this threat tim snapped and hit tasha repeatedly in the head with the baseball bat. Ryan claimed he left the garage at this point to check on their sleeping four-year-old daughter. Ryan and Tim placed, then placed Tasha's bloody body, bloody and beaten body, along with her motorcycle in the back of Ryan's Chevy pickup truck. Tim got behind the wheel and was driving about 50 miles an hour as they headed toward Andover, which is about three or four miles away. They left the tailgate open as they drove, Ryan claimed that Tim jerked the wheel several times until Natasha's body and her motorcycle fell out of the back of the truck. Why so he's driving he, fast and jerking what, so that she'll just, just fly out. Why not just? Because they're trying to make it, it look like a motorcycle accident, right? Well, they make, did a really bad job of that. Well, they're dumbasses. Okay. So, I mean, what thank God. Ryan said, you know, this was how they planned to dispose of her body, make it look like a motorcycle accident. Okay. And they like you said, they just were dumbasses and, and they, they did a shitty job, thank, th thankfully. Thankfully. Fuck them. Ryan testified that he and Tim parted ways about 12.30 a.m., which was around the same time that Tasha's body had been discovered by that passing motorist. Ryan went to the garage when he got home and he tore up the piece, he tore up and cut out that piece of the bloodied carpet. He also stated that he wrapped can't, the baseball I can't bat. Even with that. I know. He wrapped the baseball bat in newspapers and he placed it in a dumpster at an Anoka car wash. And that's what he did with the bat. And then he went and threw out that scrap of carpet in another dumpster. The baseball bat's never been found. After cleaning the garage and disposing of the evidence, Ryan then prepared to take his daughter to school. Time to go to school. Get yeah. up. Samantha. Yeah. Time to go. You want breakfast? I know, right? Like just and when he got the call going on. from her from her employer. Oh no, yeah, I don't I never seen, seen her. her. She didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And he did admit on the stand that he lied to police in his initial interview. Well, no shit, yeah. Sherlock. Right. <laughs> I mean They had to get him to admit it, I guess, on the record. In March of twenty ten, Anoka County District Judge Lawrence. Johnson sentenced him to 11 years in prison what? For, for first degree manslaughter. What? Mm -hmm. Do you want to know what the sentencing guidelines are for this offense? 80%. Yeah. Six, Time. six to eight and a half years. If oh, unbelievable. Well, yeah. that's when he can what? Um, try to get parole. Try to get parole, right? Mm -hmm. If Tim had been found guilty on the original charges of second degree homicide, he could have been sentenced to 21 to 30 and a half years in prison. Ryan was also sentenced in 2018 to eight years in prison. Yep. Sorry. For, for his part in the cover up or attempted cover up 
of Tasha's death. It pisses me off. Well, you're going to be pissed even more. What? Because guess what? Don't. No. Mm-hmm. No. Yep. You already know what I'm going to say. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Because you're that... angry. Because you're angry. Okay, go ahead. Ryan was released from prison in 2018, and Tim was released in 2021. After serving how long? Uh, let's see. The sentencing was in 2010, so eight years mm-hmm. for Ryan and 11 years for Tim. That's all you get for killing Murdering. your sister-in-law and yeah. your wife. Yeah. Both men still remain free. Ryan has moved on and has gotten married. I knew you were going to say that. Can you believe it? Um, he's a reform man. And now he runs his father's construction business, so I'm sure he's also financially secure. He's probably going to send some nasty hate comments onto well, this you know. podcast. Onto well, he fucking did it, so suck it. Yeah. Well, he did his time. Tim was last known to be working at a bar somewhere in oh. Minnesota. A benefit was held for Tasha's daughter shortly after Tasha's death. I'm assuming that Ryan lost custody. Yes. Yes, he did. I mean, he had to have. Yeah. And then by that time, she would have been 12. Yeah. And it'd be too late for him to regain, but he could have parenting time. Yeah. Who was who had um, applied for custody or petitioned for custody was Tasha's sister and brother-in-law. And they had been taking care of Samantha. So that's who took care of her after um, Tasha's death and Ryan's sentencing. The benefit was lovely. It, there was appearance by the Minnesota Vikings cheerleaders. There was live music, and all the proceeds went to the benefit of Samantha's education fund. Ah, that is nice. Tasha's cousin commented, because I don't want to end this on, like, a shitty note that these assholes are out free. So we're going to kind of focus on maybe a little positive this that occurred nice. afterward. Tasha's cousin commented on the love that Tasha had for her daughter because, you know, she was little when she lost her mom. And I think it's valuable to hear these things or read these things when you grow up and when you lose a parent. And she said, quote, they were pretty much inseparable. Everything she did, she did for Samantha. Samantha resembles Natasha as a child with blonde hair, and she has the same energy, smile and free spirit that Tasha had, end quote. Natasha's cousin added that every time you look at Samantha, you see Tasha. Oh, that makes me sad. Yeah, so they yes. they consider themselves blessed. They have a beautiful memory of Tasha. She was laid to rest. She was only 28. She was laid to rest Sunday, September 21st, 2008. In lieu of flowers, the family asked that donations be made to Samantha's education fund. Um, And that's the end of our story, but I do like to say if you or someone you know is involved in an abusive relationship, you can speak to somebody today for help. Call 800-799-7233, or you can text START to 88788. START. S-T-A-R-T. Oh. And you can be connected to someone that can help you. Phone lines are open 24-7. So you will always get someone. Someone will answer. Yeah, if you call or text. So, And then we need to give credit to our lovely writer. Yes, our lovely writer, Rachel. Rachel Stiller. Rachel Stiller. She uh, wrote and researched this episode for us. She researched the fuck out of it. Yeah. I mean, she did an amazing job, and she did a great, I mean, she's amazing, and yeah. she deserves a round of applause. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. And thank you to True Crime Daily for having us still on your channel. And thank you for... Oh, you're very welcome. You're very <laughs> welcome, thank all of you. you. Yeah. For the story. If you have enjoyed... Um, enjoy might be the wrong word. But if you... Receive like pleasure? No, yeah. that's, not no right. that's not right. That's not right. If you'd like to hear more episodes... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> ...that Talia and I have hosted... Um, Obviously, we have over 200 free episodes that are available on any podcast app. Um, There are a few here on True Crime Daily. Um, But if you'd like even more, you can go to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes, and you can sign up. Uh, We issue one uh, audio episode a week. Yeah. One per week to our first degree members. And you can also subscribe if you listen to us on the Apple 
uh, podcast, podcast app, you can subscribe there too. And but get we've the had same trouble episodes. this week getting it uploaded. Yeah, I don't know why. I, what's going on with Apple? I know, and you can't. There's Apple, no one to call. On? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, can't, you, you can't just call. One eight hundred Apple. Yeah. Guess what? You get clicked. Nothing happens. So occasionally we have an issue. Um, but we do have an episode that was supposed to be released, and we're going to release it ASAP. I, I fell asleep trying to do it. <laughs> yeah. Woke up in the middle of the night trying to do it, yeah. and it still wouldn't go. It just decides when it wants to work. Yeah. You can go to our website, crimesandconsequences.com. You can um, uh, find merchandise there. You can also find it's information lovely. about joining yeah. Patreon. There's a link. And um, we are on social media, even though we haven't updated it in a while. So um, not a, not a, social a lot media. of stuff's been going on in our lives, in yeah. our personal lives. So we have been behind on engaging on social media, but we're there. So if you want to mm-hmm. do it for us, reach out. Yeah. <laughs> Contact <laughs> us at, <laughs> what is it? Contact, Contact at yeah. crimesandconsequences.com. We'll and say you, you want to be our social media <laughs> expert. <laughs> we'll let you do it. I don't know. Contact, whatever you want to call it. So until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.